Today, we are taking a look at the Midas MR18 digital mixer. And it's a really similar mixer to the Behringer X-Air 18 or 12. They're very similar. It's just the number of channels that are different. And if you can run one, you can run the other. So if you've got one of those, you're still in the right place. I'm going to give you an overview of how this works and how to get it set up and running in this video. In future videos, we'll go over more stuff like channel processing, aux sends, and some of the more creative things that you can do with this little mixer. Before we get started, there are some other things that you need other than the digital mixer. You're going to need a wireless router. Even though this has one built in, it's garbage and you shouldn't use it. You can see over here, there's the ethernet port for connecting hardwired internet. And so I've got my ethernet cable that you'll want to plug into there. And this little switch that chooses whether it's the Wi-Fi client access point or ethernet, just keep it over there on ethernet. You're going to want to do that. You might even take a chisel and file off that knob and put some tape or some cement over it. You don't want to switch that off. You really just want to use the hardware wired connection for this little digital mixer. That's the short story, but the longer story is that if you use it during sound check, it's usually fine. But when you get into a room full of people who bring their cell phones, who are all pinging for different Wi-Fi networks, it'll overload this one and kick you off while you're mixing. So you don't want to do that. Get an external router. This one's from ASUS. There's a reason why it's called ASUS. It's inexpensive, but it works. This one's fine. I'm not an IT specialist, so don't ask my recommendation on what you should get and what's going to be the most robust, because I don't know. The next thing that you'll need is an iPad or another kind of tablet or a computer to run the software. I'll put a link to the software on Midas's website so that you can get directly to that. It's not on the App Store for desktop devices, but it is in the App Store for your iPad, and I'm assuming for your Android device as well. As you're making your shopping list, one more thing that I highly recommend that you get, aside from headphones, these headphones are from One Audio. They sent them to me to try out. I've been testing them for a long time. They seem pretty robust and comfortable, but you'll also want one of these 3.5 millimeter to quarter inch stereo inputs. So you can plug in something like a phone if you're old school like me and you still have a headphone output on your phone, good for you. This can plug in very easily to any of these channels because they have both mic and line inputs, but it's especially helpful to go right into the line 17 and 18 because we want something simple to be able to test out our outputs. Bigger picture, when you're setting up a sound system, I recommend that you set up your outputs first, right? So get your speakers in place, make sure that your mic lines or power amps are all hooked up to going to those, and then they're powered on, pointed in the right spot so that you can test those before you go on to setting up your inputs and making sure that all that is working. I have a very simple input that we go straight from a phone or something that we can plug in our main left and right outputs. Now for me, I'm doing a demonstration for you. I've got these two mic cables connected to my field recorder that records this microphone too so that you can hear all the stuff. I'm not going to speakers right now, so I'm going to plug those in so that you guys can hear that, and I'm going to plug in the headphones so that we can hear that there as well. That's basically how you get set up, but we want to make sure that we can control it and then we need to be able to test it. With the iPad or device connected to the same Wi-Fi network as the router and yeah, you can connect the internet to the router as well if you want, but for right now, I don't. So after you have this hooked up here, now we need to connect to the console or the mixer with our iPad. Let me show you how to do that. Now that we're connected to the right Wi-Fi network, let's open the M Air app. And for right now, I'm going to go ahead and go to what you might see if you're just starting it up for the first time. Here on this launch screen, you can go into demo mode if you don't have a console in front of you and you want to play around with stuff. You can definitely download the app and use it in standalone or or demo mode and connect to either one of those devices. Here on the same network, it's already showing the device I've connected to before and it will search for it and find it automatically. So we tap that and this takes us to our device control screen. So if we're starting with a totally clean console, this is probably what it's gonna look like when you get started. You've got your channel faders along the bottom. You've got your channel processing up here in the top section. And then we've got these tabs across the top for getting to the different functions of the console. Now, before we get into all the nitty gritty of the inputs, let's just go ahead and test and make sure that our outputs are working. I'll make sure that it's getting to my recorder, which would be the same as you getting it and testing your speakers to make sure that they're functioning. Remember, we want to eliminate as many variables as we can as we're setting up so that we solve problems when they're simple. So I'm going to grab my phone and turn on some pink noise. I would usually play music, but 
I don't want to get a copyright strike, and using pink noise gives you a little more audio engineer street cred. So let me grab the signal generator on my phone, turn on the pink noise. Okay, it's working on the speaker. Plug this in here. All right, so I'm gonna scroll over here and I can see that I've got some level on this aux input. Turn up the output all the way on there. You'll see that there's level here on the aux input, but there's no level over here on the main. And as I'm looking at my recorder, there's no level coming into there as well. If I had speakers on, there would be nothing there. I've got my headphones. Yeah, there's nothing. And the reason for that is that by default, the console boots up with the main fader all the way down. So we have to go in and turn up our main fader. And now I'm hearing on the headphones. So I'm getting a little bit of level on my field recorder. And so I know that if I had speakers hooked up, there would be some signal going to those as long as they're hooked up correctly. So I'm gonna mute that because it's annoying. And while we're talking about testing stuff on the headphones, let me jump ahead to some of the setup stuff so you can see where the headphone feed is coming from. If I go back here and I go to setup and I go over to audio and MIDI, you can see where the monitor sound source is. That's for the headphones here. And right now it's on the left right bus AFL, meaning the fader, or it's after fader listen. So the fader level will affect the level of what's sent to the headphones. So that's there. There's a bunch of other controls that you can have for channels can be PFL or AFL. Your buses can be PFL or AFL. That just means when you hit solo, I don't have to have the fader up over here in order to listen to it on the headphones. So I hit solo again, that's cleared, and now we would be listening to the main bus again. As we continue to hook up stuff with our console, I want you to pay attention to this Ultranet port. This makes it so that you can plug in a P16 personal monitor mixers from Behringer, which are very inexpensive and very robust. So we can take a whole lot of work off your hands as the engineer and let each musician craft their own monitor mix from all 16 channels coming on the board. This is a fantastic option and I'm super glad they included this. It makes it very affordable to get a 18 channel mixer with personal monitor mixers for a very little amount of money. So don't sleep on this, even though it's less expensive and kind of in your budget category, it can be a pretty heavy hitter and get you a whole lot of results. Now that we've tested our outputs, let's plug in a mic into one of our mic inputs so that we can see how to do that and get it up and running. One other thing that you might notice is that these are TRS XLR combo jacks. What does that mean for the average person that doesn't speak audio ease? It means that you can plug in a regular mic cable like this one, or you could plug in a line level TRS signal coming into this input channel. Those look very similar to your quarter inch inputs that come from instruments, but for an instrument, you will still need a direct box because this is looking for a line level signal, not an instrument level signal. And we have to convert that to get the proper impedance so that your instrument sounds its best. Might it still work if you plug a guitar or a bass straight into this input? Yes, but it could be a weaker signal and more noisy. So you want to use a DI as a best practice. We got a microphone here. The other end of the cable is down here somewhere. Of course, I had to have the 25 foot cable for a demonstration where I'm sitting in one spot. So we've got our mic cable. We're gonna plug it into channel one. It's gonna show up on channel one. So if we scroll over here and select this channel, we have to go back here. We can select the very top section to get to the input section. Here we can see the mic gain or how much we're gonna turn up this microphone and a few other parameters that we'll discuss. As I talk into this microphone, you can see that there's a little bit of level coming in on there and this level meter right beside the channel fader. As we turn up the mic gain, so if you touch the knob and slide your finger up, it's gonna turn the knob counterclockwise. So touch and drag up, turns it up. And we're gonna go up to about 30, 35 dB of gain. And our goal here is to hit somewhere between where the green turns into yellow, right? We don't want red because that's gonna clip. We're gonna just keep turning this up. If I turn it up till it clips, yeah, that's a bad thing. We've run out of room to turn it up anymore. It's not turned up so you're not gonna be able to hear it on the output, but you can see there it's turning red. And even as I'm getting louder, the line doesn't go up anymore. So we know that we've clipped at that point. We would not want to listen to this. I'll spare you the details. So we're gonna turn this down to about 35. And you can see we're there right where green turns into yellow. And if I get really loud, it goes up a little bit more. Maybe I need to back it up off a little bit more. This mic's got a little bit hotter output than I'm used to. So then when we get really loud, we've still got room and that's called headroom. We want to make some distance between our normal operating level and where it's going to clip or distort. So that's about 30 dB of gain on this mic and that's going to be fine. Another control that you're going to want to listen to. So let me turn this up so that we can hear it and I'm going to put on the headphones so I can hear what's going on on the output of the board. 
check one, two. So now that I've switched over to this mic input, so you're listening to the output of the board, you can tell that compared to my other mic that I'm using for the video recording, it's really full and dark and muffled. We want to take care of that. And there's another control here on the input section that we can use to do that. Here where it says high pass fi filter frequency or HPF freak, we can turn that on. And this high pass filter is going to dump out low end. So as I turn this up, the mic is going to start to get a little bit thinner. And now it's a little bit less covered and a little bit less cluttered. So we get more clarity as we cut low end that's masking those higher frequencies. I can turn it up too high so that it sounds thin and a little bit nasally. But we don't want to do that. So we're going to back that off until it sounds natural again. And I'm at about 140 hertz. That's probably a good starting place for a male vocal and I have a lower voice. So this works well for me. Let me turn it off again so that you can hear what it was like without it. And yes, that big bass boost comes up from me being close to the microphone. We're going to turn that back on and now it sounds a little bit thinner and a little bit clearer. That's a good thing. So this one knob, if you can use this to clear up your inputs and you get your balance right on the faders and you get your gain set right by getting the right amount of level coming into the console, you're going to be set up for success and you're not going to have a whole lot of problems. Everything else above that is icing on the cake. Now, let me try a different microphone to demonstrate one other thing that might trip you up and hopefully keep you out of a pinch. So let me mute this real quick. Now, if you were just to listen to what's coming through this microphone, it would be very low level and it would be very noisy. I've got this mic back on so that you can still hear what I'm saying, but this mic basically has no output now. The settings are exactly the same as the other microphone, but what's the difference? This microphone is a condenser microphone. It needs phantom power or 48 volts of DC current coming back into the microphone through the mic cable in order to power a little internal preamp that makes it function. So up above the gain knob, there's the 48 volts button. We're going to make sure that we mute our channel before we do that and then turn that on. You'll see a little bit of a level bump there as that preamp is turning on inside of the microphone. And now I unmute it. And as I switch back to this microphone, now you can hear it. Some mics and direct boxes need phantom power. So if it says active or condenser, you're going to want to turn on that plus 48 volts button so that those can function and get you out of a pinch. Before we move on, there are a few more things that I want to show you in the setup menu just to get them out of the way. So over here on the setup tab, on the general. Here you can initialize the mixer and it also gives you some mute options for mute groups and DCAs. By default, it's in soft mute mode, which means hard mute is not turned on. And that means that if you mute a channel, mute it with a mute group, and then unmute that mute group, that means that the channel will unmute. In hard mute mode, if you mute the channel, regardless of whether you mute or unmute the mute group, then that stays muted. It's the same thing with the DCA mutes. For DCA groups, if you turn that on and you mute the DCA, it will also mute the input channel. So that's one of those random settings that's a little bit weird, but just leave that in the default. For the network options, this is how you can connect and do all that IP address stuff that goes beyond my pay grade. If you're an IT pro, you can put in the comments what you would suggest, but I think you should stay on DHCP and then you can see the IP address and the octets for the mask and gateway if you've got all of that stuff. And the Wi-Fi client and access point, just ignore that because you're never gonna use it if you're smart. You can name your device if you want, and then you would have to apply it. And it shows the IP address there in case maybe you need to put another device in the same IP address realm as this one. You can match the first you know, two or three sets of those numbers if you need to. On the layout page, this is where things get kind of fun and a little bit flexible. So we can actually name our inputs. So later I'm gonna plug in a kick drum here on channel one and I can give it a color so that all my types of channels are color coded. I'm not gonna go through and name all of these for you right now because that would be pretty tedious, but we can name our scribble strips there, not just for the inputs, but we can go down to our effects so we could label which effects are which. Say if we've got vocal reverb and vocal delay and drum reverb, we could label those on the effects and we could label our buses as well. If you want to label like whose monitor mixes whose, you can do that here also. There are also custom layers. So you could have all channels, which does not include the DCAs for some reason, but we have all channels. You could just have channels one through eight. If it's a simpler setup, you got stuff going on there, nine through 16, etc. I set up one that's got vocal monitors. So if you had given this device or you let somebody have their device and they just wanted to see the channels that are essential for them to control their bus and 
their main mix. Here I've got kick, snare, and the overheads, or what was the overheads. It's not all labeled right now, so it's not as effective to do. Let me recall my names real quick. Load show, start with names, load. There we go. Now that we have our channels labeled and we can see what's what, for the vocal monitor layout, we've got kick, snare, and bass, electric guitar, keys one, keys two, overhead left. I don't know why it's jumping off over here and not over there. Let's see if I could move it. Can I move it? Aha. Uh -huh. So you can move it to get it in the right order. And then we could add, oh, see we've got this pencil lit up. We can add other channels and move them around if we want. And maybe they want the other vocalists to hear them too. And the crowd mics because everybody needs crowd mics in their in-ear monitors. So now we untap the pencil and now we can see for the vocalists monitor mix, they have kick, snare, and overheads the bass, the guitars, the keyboards, and then all the vocals instead of every single channel, right? So if we go to all channels, that might be a bit much. We can try to simplify things for people that don't need control over every single thing and choose those different layouts. You can edit those layouts and somebody can connect their device and choose that on their own as well. A wide button is also helpful if you've got chunky fingers, but I like the narrow button because I want to see more channels immediately. I don't want to scroll around back and forth so much. I did also make James style, which includes the DCAs. So DCAs are a way of remote controlling different groups of inputs on their faders. So if I wanted to turn all the drums down all at once or all the band down all at once, I could do that with a DCA of channels that are assigned to that. But we'll talk about that more in another lesson. I just wanted to show you the layout page and how that's available. Undo the pencil on there. Now on the audio MIDI settings, I recommend that you stay in 48K just for fun. The RTA could be pre or post. So this would mean if you're looking at the RTA or the real-time analyzer while you're EQing things, you could see that how it sounds before or the level relationship between those frequencies before the EQ or after the EQ. I think it'd be on post personally because I want to see what's still maybe popping up. And mute at power on is a good setting to have just so that you don't suddenly turn stuff on and stuff's blaring if your amps are already on. So mute at power on is a good thing and you're linking controls for when you stereo link more than one input. Let me show you that real quick, even though we'll get to that in other parts. If we go to our overheads, you can see we've got overhead left and overhead right. On our input, if we hit link and then set yes, it says link channels of five and six, it only does odd even pairs. We hit yes, and now those two channels are gonna move in a coordinated way. When we go back to our setup page on the audio MIDI, that's gonna link which parameters are linked or let us select which ones are linked. So if we wanna have different EQ on one side or the other, we could deselect EQ, but in general, you're gonna wanna leave all of those there. MIDI is for if you have a fader port type controller, or I can't remember the Behringer name for the fader bank that they have. You can actually have faders that are assigned and motorized so that you can have some faders along with this if you want. That's cool, but I personally think the iPad is fine, especially for the price that you pay for all those motorized faders. That plus this, might as well just get a full-fledged console. That's my opinion. And then we talked about the monitor section earlier as well. So that's the overview of all the setup menu and kind of the stuff that you might want to look into or hopefully not get tripped up by if one of these parameters is wrong or off. So keep that in mind when you're getting set up. When you're getting your church sound system set up, it's really helpful to know not just how to hook it up, but what does winning sound like? And so to help clarify that, I created a free guide called How to Lead Your Church Sound Team. It walks you through all the step-by-step -step questions you need to ask between the sound team, the worship team, and the leadership team so that you can get a functioning guide on what winning sounds like. It's helped a whole lot of churches know exactly what parameters are there so that we can have course correction conversations rather than you stink and you need to try ushering. The guide is totally free and there's a link to sign up for the download down in the description below. In the next video, we'll go over how the channel processing works so that you can understand all the different parameters that are on each individual channel going through your board. I'll put a link to that one and all the rest of the videos in this playlist down in the description below. Remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo, and nobody leaves church humming the kick drum. We'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.